What can you learn from filming a street in Paris for 10 hours straight and studying every single person who uses that space? Yeah, welcome to my dorky urbanist existence. Hey everybody, Michael here. I am living in Paris at the moment on an artist's residency. And I'm sitting here working at the window, but I have been captivated by the choreography of the street right outside my apartment. So I decided to employ a methodology that I have been using for over a decade in urbanism. I filmed the street with a time lapse for over 10 hours and I counted and observed absolutely everything that happened. This is direct human observation. And while it is so incredibly time consuming, there is absolutely nothing that beats it. The title I chose is the choreography of an otherwise unremarkable street in Paris. But one of the books that I love most about Paris is called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. 1975, the author is Georges Perec. So this is essentially a combination of the work I've been doing for over a decade, the methodology I've been using, but I'm also riffing off of Monsieur Perec's work. Really, it is an urbanist's attempt at exhausting a place in Paris. I started using this methodology back in 2012, and you can see this film here if you're interested, wherein I study 106,000 cyclists in five cities around the world and directly observe their behavior and also do all the data counting as well. It is easier with a simple straight street section like the one I'll show you today than an intersection, for example. So what I do is I have the footage and I draw a mental line across the middle of it and I count everything that crosses that line. And then afterwards, I start observing the behavior, starting to break it down into the human details of how the users use the space. It is so labor intensive, but I can tell you it is so rewarding and it is so addictive. Completely a Zen experience. Let's have a look at this street. It is Rue de la Perle in Le Marais neighborhood in Paris in the third arrondissement. It was a Tuesday, temperature five degrees, it was dry. The street is unremarkable in that there are not many destinations on it as such. There is an elementary school on the left and you can see how the road has been narrowed in the middle, right in front of the school. They put in metal fencing, essentially bottlenecking the street. This is something you see in many parts of Paris at the moment. If they don't close off the street completely to cars in front of the school with their program that they call Rue aux Ecoles, which is kind of like streets to the schools, but it also has this kind of vibe of bringing the street back to the school. Then they try to traffic home and protect that space. And every school day, the parents drop off their kids like they're doing here. I think they're waiting for the school to open in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they come back to pick up their little darlings. The rest of the street doesn't really offer up many destinations at all. There are apartments on my side. On the other side, there are also apartments, social housing. Another thing that is really cool about Paris, these blurred lines between uh, different income brackets. And then farther up the street, I think there's some offices on the left and on the corner, a cafe and a bike shop. In the other direction behind the camera, there are a couple of cafes, more apartments, but really incredibly unremarkable. It is mostly a transitory space for the vast majority of the users passing through it. There is this unusual amount of space off to the right, this incredibly wide sidewalk. I found a photo from 1949 and I can see that the street used to be incredibly wide and cars parked freely along it. There was also a bit of a space at the end, maybe kind of a little square or a building that had been knocked down at some point. It is now occupied by an apartment building, the social housing that I mentioned. It's actually behind me through the window. And after that building was built in the 1960s, some urban choices were made. The street was narrowed in and trees were planted. The street is a link through Le Marais neighborhood between two larger boulevards, Boulevard Sebastopol and Boulevard Beaumarchais. It is also a one-way street, one of countless one-way streets in this fantastic, beautiful one-way street system that is a big part of the Paris identity. All of it makes driving a car incredibly difficult. Yay. Okay, so let's have a look at the numbers. And I can tell you that there are a lot of numbers when you're dealing with a street in a city like Paris. So let's check it out. First of all, let's do the bikes. In the course of the 10 hours, there were 966 bikes going down the street. Of those, 15 of them were cargo bikes. 
of those cargo bikes, 11 of them were logistics. Last mile delivery, the other four were families with kids. Bikes made up 31.4% of all the vehicles passing down the street that day. There are lots of pedestrians. <laughs> this is a city with 3.2 million pedestrians every single day, so that's not really uh, a surprise at all, is it? And on this street that day, there were 3,653 pedestrians. I counted them in all the four directions that they traveled. Interestingly, there was only one wheelchair user in the whole day, man. And I can tell you that's not a surprise because Paris is not at all a wheelchair friendly city. The movement of cars has been restricted, of course, but there were still cars, duh. There were 586 cars that day. Um, I had no idea of being able to see which ones were you know, ride sharing services like Uber or anything, but the vast majority of them were private cars. I think there were some service vehicles from the city of Paris in there as well, but we're basically talking about the typology of the vehicle. And then you have the motorbikes and the scooters and then like other European cities. Yeah, they're a plague. They are the fastest moving vehicles on the urban landscape in a city like this, man. And they take up so much space on sidewalks for parking. Oh, but they're there and I counted them dutifully. 599 motorbikes and scooters. I combined them both into one little group and that is 19.4% of the vehicles that day. 32 of them had a passenger on the back, almost all of them in the morning. Somebody dropping off somebody else at work or wherever they're going. And then you have vans, lots and lots of vans. And here I included smaller vans as well as passenger vans with windows. I had no idea how to differentiate based on the footage I had. But most of them were workers, carpenters, plumbers, whatever, going off to do a job or perhaps doing deliveries. 505 vans, 16.4%. Then there are trucks, all sorts of trucks, man. Anything really bigger than a large van, I counted as a truck. Uh, transport, garbage trucks, cement trucks, fire trucks, you name it. Um, and that was 127 of those, 4.1% of the total. 127 taxis. That is 4.1% of the total. And there is a bus route running down this street. And I counted a total of 17 buses. So if you look at micromobility, Paris it has really made a lot of effort to restrict the use of that new Segway, that toy for lazy young boys, the e-scooter. And they will actually be having a referendum here in 2023 about whether or not they should ban all the private companies completely. So let's cross our fingers and hope that they die. We have basically legislated them out of existence in Copenhagen. Montreal has made some amazing progress on that front, and there are so many European cities who are desperately trying to figure out how to get rid of them now. But they're there, and I counted them, and there was only 101 in the course of the day. A massive change from back in 2019 when they dropped out of the sky in cities all over Europe, man. They have really reined them in. 101. 3.2% of all the vehicles. And then you have the bits and pieces, the loose change, six skateboarders, five people on kick scooters, the normal ones that we used to do when we were kids, uh, but actually two of those were adults, which is something that you see in a lot of European cities um, as a quick way to get around your neighborhood. There was one person on roller skates and one massive dork on his monowheel. Whatever. 114 of these micro-mobility devices, including skateboards in there as well, um, through the course of the day. And after you do all the counting, the number crunching, then you get to look at the deviations, the behavior, and how people deviate from the existing traffic rules. This street is a straight stretch through the neighborhood and it is quite intuitive for everybody who uses it. Compared to other chaotic streets and intersections in Paris and the latter, oh my God, there are lots of those in this city. There are limited opportunities on this street, Rue de la Perle, for deviating because of the design. So the question is, who were the naughtiest users of the space? The ones that deviated from the traffic laws in order to kind of hack their way through the street. The worst offenders were the e-scooters. Now, there were only 100 of those in the course of the day, you'll remember, but 13.8% of them broke a traffic law. And that is actually not even that dramatic. And what they did was ride the wrong way down the street or use one of the sidewalks. And then number two, you have motorbikes and scooters. 9.6% broke a traffic law in the same ways as the e-scooters. But I really want to give a big shout out to these two guys right here who were stuck in this traffic jam and decided to get up onto the sidewalk and move around it. They walked their heavy motorbikes all the way to the end of the street. Total respect. Super cool. Next up is bikes. 7.8% out of 966 cyclists rode the wrong way down the street or rode on the sidewalks, mostly on the wide sidewalk on the right. But it's really important to point out one simple fact. 
Most of the cyclists riding on the sidewalk on the right were simply trying to get to or from the bike share station, the Vilip station. And there's a long line of them on the right side. I think there's about 40 different uh, bike racks for them there. So after they got on the bike or as they were approaching the rack, they did so in my observations really calmly, slowly and considerately as they navigated the crowds before they got back to the street and off they went. So if you look at the street, only 1.34% of the bicycle users rode the wrong way down the street. A really good colleague of mine uh, has done some comprehensive direct observation studies of several chaotic Parisian intersections, and he has seen levels of deviation like 15, 25%, depending on how crappy the design of it is. But still, that low number, riding the wrong way down the street, really surprised me. I would have guessed that that number would have been a lot higher. So let's look at pedestrians. Let's divide this up into two different groups. I looked at the 0.43%, basically 16 people who just walked down the middle of the street, down that bottleneck in the middle. And in the other category, you know, I am not really that worried about it. I'm not worried about pedestrians crossing the street in the middle of the block because as the late great Mr. David Bowie once saying, this is not America, no. Come on, I don't give a shit about this American concept of jaywalking invented by the automobile industry in the 1920s in order to get pedestrians the hell out of the way, man. This is a European city, man. Existing desire lines for centuries, and I think it's fine that the pedestrians cross the street. But hey, if we're gonna do it right, according to French traffic law, you shouldn't cross the street unless there is no pedestrian crossing within 50 meters. And the law states very clearly that you have to cross perpendicular to the curb. <laughs> In a city like Paris with 3.2 million pedestrians, yeah, good luck with that theory. But I was curious, so I actually measured the street and here is the small zone where you can technically, legally cross it. Perpendicular, of course, please, but it happens to be right where the metal barriers are in front of the school. But still, out of all the pedestrians that day, only 8.2% crossed the street illegally. And I mapped out where they crossed. There were a number of desire lines, especially up at the top of the street, um, but the primary locations were these ones. It makes you wonder where they're going, you know? The primary trajectory heading east, you know, back behind the camera, is continuing down the same street. The Picasso Museum is up the side street, but most people continue back towards the big boulevard and all the other things that they find before they get there. And I think they cross the street, especially at the spot in front of my apartment, um, for two reasons. I think they're trying to cut the corner when they get past my building and the street does this little dog leg, you know, just sort of cutting that corner off there. But they also might be subconsciously avoiding this little tunnel underneath the apartment building with the social housing on the other side of the street. It's not really a creepy space at all, but I think a lot of people maybe make the conscious decision to take one of the other routes. All in all, throughout the course of the day, these pedestrians following their naturally occurring desire lines in the city of Paris, yeah, there was no drama. It was all fine. People just doing what people have done in the city for centuries. And if you look at the behavior of the motor vehicle users, yeah. There wasn't a lot of deviation at all, man. It's almost immeasurable. Motor vehicles are completely locked into this street. They have been put in their place by the design. There was one car that backed up during a traffic jam in the morning. I don't know how he did it or where he went, but he totally disappeared from the footage. Nine taxis, private chauffeurs, and delivery vans parked on the sidewalk right outside the apartment for short periods. Like this truck, unloading and heading up the street to, I think, the cafe on the corner with whatever goods the cafe needs today. The private chauffeur, however, he wanders over for a chat, which is just really nice, you know? He hangs out outside his car, waiting for a famous person in the apartment across from me here uh, to come out, and he takes them to work and brings them back in the afternoon, right? But I've just noticed, also through the course of a few weeks, this guy is just incredibly sociable, chatting with so many people who pass by. And this medic in a van had to get on the sidewalk and then back up to try to get back into traffic. But everything worked out fine. There was no honking. Generally, in the course of this day, this is Paris, man, there was very little honking. Very little impatient behavior from the motorists, you know, who always have this hand hovering over the horn in this city.
And then that's the number crunching and all the data collection. And then you get to do the observations, man, the direct human observation. And uh, these are all the extracurricular details of how the users use the space. What I love about cities is that you never know what they're going to throw at you, man, wherever you are in the world. And I had been sitting staring out at the street from my desk and I ended up way more captivated by the choreography of it than actually working, which is basically why we're here today. An intersection, especially a really badly designed one, offers up much more drama than a straight stretch like this. But still, there were moments to be had. This is one of the longest traffic jams in the morning, the longest one I observed, and lots of hacking the street and seeking other routes. This motorcycle dude, he spotted it right away, way up there, man, and he just hopped onto the sidewalk and blew past in order to get around it. This cyclist realized a little bit late in the day, oh, can't squeeze past on the right, um, so he just spun around and found another path which is the beauty of the bicycle, right? The versatility and the flexibility in a city. And this is where the car backed up and disappeared from hopefully existence. And another cyclist makes a break for freedom from the car centric chaos. And then there's these two motorcycle dudes I mentioned before. They stop and they think about it. They look around, they actually have a chat. I don't know, should we do something about this? They back up their heavy bikes, get it onto the sidewalk and they walk politely around the traffic jam. I knew from applying this methodology to streets for more than a decade that I would gather a lot of data about how people use it, but also this wealth of addictive observations, man. It is simply so addictive watching all these people and how they interact with their city. Firstly, something happened on the street that mirrors what I have seen in all the other cities that I have studied through the years. During busy times, mostly in the morning, the behavior of the users was largely exemplary. Few deviations from the rules. In the afternoon, when traffic waned, I noticed that this is where there is a lot more freestyle behavior, whether it's Paris or another city. It is so interesting that this really seems to be universal. That behavioral deviation increases when car traffic fades. The number of people, for example, cycling the wrong way down a street increases in these periods. It's not through the roof at all, right? But it is absolutely measurable. The space provided by the absence of motor vehicles opens up the street. It gives us freedom to follow our desire lines in a city. And the reason, oh, I've been thinking about this for many, many years. It is simply that we as humans, when there is a lot of traffic, that means there are a lot of fellow citizens around us. And when that happens, we tend to stick to the rules. We don't want to stick out like a sore thumb and deviate because everybody will notice it. It's a subconscious thing, but we are generally considerate. When the street empties out of it, oh yeah, we are subconsciously aware that not many people are watching us right now. And that is where we make the choice to freestyle a little bit more than normal. The curb bump out in the middle of the street, the bottleneck in front of the school, uh, it really makes the street look tight, right? Um, it's about 3.5 meters wide. And with so many types of traffic users in this city, I thought that there would be some real nail biting observations to be had, but you know what? absolutely everything fit without a problem. Here there are a couple of cars parked on the sidewalk, the chauffeur waiting for the fancy man and the uh, taxi on the other side waiting for a customer. And then this bus just blows right through. Obviously the chauffeur knows the route, he knows the width, he's used to it, but still really impressive. Here's a taxi he's trying to back onto the sidewalk to wait for a passenger, bit of a clumsy thing he's doing there, but then the passenger suddenly shows up and says, dude, I'm here, can I get in? So he gets in and the taxi navigates away from the location. And all the cars waiting, they just wait. This is just life in a densely populated city and people seem to understand that. That guy needs his taxi, it's awkward, but yeah, it won't last very long. Here a car passes a bicycle user without much drama at all. I saw that all day long. Some of the motorbikes, Oh, they really just hammer past bikes on this stretch here, but still nobody really flinches at all. I noticed that the motorized traffic came in constant bunches, you know, uh, throughout the day. And well, this is simply because of the light signalization farther down the pipeline on the big boulevards feeding the cars into the street. But bikes and e-scooters were much more even throughout the day in their flow. Bikes, uh, have contra flow on all the one-way streets here. Um, E-scooters probably do as well, or they just don't care. But it just simply means that they were more constant throughout the day. 
Here is an idea of the traffic volume through the day. Something I see in other cities as well, but it was really noticeable here in Paris. Motorized vehicles and bikes and pedestrians, right? Lots of delivery vans and trucks and taxis in the morning, but then they faded away a bit. At lunchtime and then later in the afternoon at about four o'clock, these were generally the quietest times. Most pedestrians know exactly where they're going, but you can see down here at the bottom right, I noticed that these two were the only ones in the course of the day that kind of just stopped and went, oh my God, where the hell are we going? We're on the wrong street, turned around and disappeared. The few pedestrians who actually walked down the middle of the street did so in the last half of the day when the streets were pretty much clear of cars. And all of them stuck to their route, just locked into that going, yep, I accept this and I'm no, I know what I'm doing and that's fine. I did notice one woman, however, I can't find it in the footage, but she walked in the middle of the street and then all of a sudden she realized, oh my God, I'm in the street and a few meters in and then she turned around and went back and used the sidewalk. One thing I love about Paris is how many people double standing up on the back of a Vilib bike share bike. I'm pretty sure the people at Vilib absolutely hate this, but it is really an incredibly popular form of transport in the city. I saw five examples of it during the day. I see more examples in other parts of Paris, absolutely. But hey, I love it every time I see it. Doubling on an e-scooter is a thing, of course, as well. And that day I saw five examples of people doing that. And here's somebody cycling in a circle while they're waiting for their friend to figure out how to get a Vilib out of the rack. Two friends, one with a Valib looking for a bike for the other guy, wandering up the many bike racks on the right, checking all the different bikes. And this is really a classic Parisian thing. Uh, lots of people spend time checking all the bikes, the gears, the brakes, the wheels, make sure there's air in the tires, checking the quality of the bike. Here's a pro tip right in the middle of this video. Uh, if you're in Paris and you want a Valib, look for the numbers on the sides of the bike. The higher the number, the better the bike's gonna be. You don't want something in 4,000, 5,000, even 10. You want something that's over 50,000 or over 60,000. Then you're guaranteed it's gonna be a new bike and good quality. Trust me, I've done the research. There's your pro tip. Most bicycle users were solo apart from some parents with kids on the back, but I observed 10 examples of what we call conversation cycling. Two cyclists riding side by side, heading off somewhere together. And these two, they didn't even flinch when this scooter just poof, zoomed past and split their defense. The question of how close is too close really varies from city to city. Throughout this entire day, there were no dramatic altercations or people freaking out because a car, a motorbike, or a bike zipped past really close. And generally, this is a really good sign for cycling in this city. Bikes are simply not a novelty anymore. They're a normal part of this city's life. There are so many people riding bikes in Paris not a cause for alarm at all. And now this guy, he's locking his bike to the fence. And I was curious, I'm going, why are you locking it there, man? Because there are no destinations on that side of the street. But then I realized, oh, this is a classic example of the bicycle magnet that I have been observing for so many years. Somebody else had parked a bike there and he went, oh, I'll park my bike next to that bike. Somebody had legitimized this behavior. Um, also maybe in a subconscious sense of security, two bikes together, it's gotta be a little bit safer. There is a pattern to this. He could have parked closer to wherever it was he was going, but he decided subconsciously to be a part of creating a bicycle magnet. Here's the one person on roller skates that day over on the sidewalk and then popping out onto the better asphalt of the street. And one of the few skateboarders as well. And when this happens, he doesn't even flinch, man. Most bicycle users who hacked the system did minor deviations, exercising their flexibility. There's some car horns outside the window here today in Paris. This guy, he really takes the I don't give a shit award of the day. He comes completely from far away, wrong direction down the one way street, over the curb, on the sidewalk, off he went. Just doesn't give a damn at all. Late in the afternoon, the dynamic of the street changed. Fewer work vans and trucks, right? Uh, and a lot more taxis as people headed out to have drinks or have dinner after work. And then I noticed that a lot of black vans, you know, mysterious black vans starting to appear. And these are probably taxis or private chauffeurs for more fancy people coming out to eat in this neighborhood. And then in the afternoon, <laughs> suddenly there was this parade of brown UPS trucks for a short amount of time, but like two waves of them. I assume that they are going back to some depot somewhere not far from here, but man, I'm thinking UPS, they are way ahead of the curve in many cities in Europe regarding last mile cargo bike delivery. Packages I get from UPS in Copenhagen arrive on a cargo bike and they have done for many years, but I just think Paris, man, 
It's a no-brainer here. This is like the second best cargo bike city in Europe. Check the description for a link to that ranking. And uh, I just think UPS, man, get some game face on in the French capital. Some things make you wonder. You know, you look at the speedy time-lapse uh, footage, and I think we all know, oh, that kind of phone call. I don't know what's going on there. We can project anything you want onto this kind of phone call. She just walked around for a very long time in circles, man. We don't know what's happening, but it is, it is this anonymous urban storytelling and poetry. And of course, it's not a time lapse unless you show up in it yourself in a Hitchcockian cameo role. This is me and my friend, another urbanist, Romain Lubier. But this is us on the street going off to do some important work, which that day involved going to a wine bar. And the moment we've all been waiting for, this is Europe. This is Paris. Of course, of course, we have to see somebody kissing on the street. And there you have it. An urbanist's attempt at exhausting a place in Europe, the choreography of an otherwise unremarkable street. Never gets old for me. I love doing this, even though it takes forever to do this methodology, but it is fascinating, rewarding, and important. Direct human observation is really the best tool we have for figuring out how to make things better in the urban landscape. And now it's time for me to head out of this apartment up to my local wine bar. Bye.